Представьте себе, что с раннего детства вы болеете чем-то вроде проказа. Это не смертельная болезнь, но выглядит отвратительно, поэтому вы скрываете ее от своих родителей, от друзей, от всех. Вы прячете пораженные места под одеждой и надеетесь, что никто вообще никогда не узнает об этой болезни. Так проходит детство, юность, но в какой-то момент родители все-таки узнают, причем не от вас, а от вашего друга. Это большое горе, и жалость к вам у родителей смешивается со стыдом. И хотя никакого настоящего лекарства от этой болезни нет, есть все-таки народные методы, которые родители предлагают вам попробовать. Они отправляют вас в глушь, в санаторий, где этими методами лечат эту болезнь. Там у вас занимают все личные вещи, телефон и берут обещание, что вы не будете больше никому рассказывать, что будет происходить внутри. А внутри, там с утра до вечера вам объясняют, что ваша болезнь – это извращение, и чтобы излечиться от нее, вам нужно собрать волю в кулак, возненавидеть всю свою прошлую жизнь и, главное, посвятить всю оставшуюся жизнь религии. На самом деле это не абстрактная история, а вполне реальная. Речь, конечно, идет не о болезни, а о гомосексуальности. Прямо сейчас, вот в эту минуту, в мире есть несколько миллионов людей, которые подвергаются так называемой конверсионной терапии, то есть лечению от гомосексуальности. Это происходит в России. И сейчас я иду в гости к писателю Гарарду Конли, который написал автобиографическую книгу «Boy Erased» или «Стертая личность». В 2018 году по книге был снят фильм, в котором э, Николь Кидман и Рассел Кроу сыграли родителей Гарарда, а Лукас Хеджес сыграл самого автора. И вот сейчас мы идем к Гарарду, чтобы поговорить о его реальной истории, о том, что такое конверсионная терапия и чем она заканчивается в лучшем и в худшем случае. And when did you realize that you're like different and you are attracted to men? Well, probably in third grade. I always think it's Which about, is like 10 years Yeah, old. I was like 10. I remember looking at my male teacher who was pretty young. He was like in his 30s. I'm going to consider that young since I'm in my 30s. He was like, I remember like just thinking, I love Mr. Smith. And then I was like, I think I actually love Mr. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of messed up but I like I just I loved everything about him and I wanted to be closer to him and I think I just sort of knew uh-oh like something's different like the other students seem to really like Mr. Smith I think I'm in love with Mr. Smith and so um which meant like in erotical way yeah I think even at the age of 10 I knew that I was like staring at him for a very long time like when he would like write on the board I would like look at his muscles move. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, come on, 10 is like <laughs> old enough for that. I yeah, mean, yeah. I had those thoughts from, I don't know, maybe seven yeah. years old. You, can, you know early, and it doesn't always take the form of a sexual look, but it's sort of, um, you just know you want to get closer. Yeah. You want to get closer and that there's, there's an attraction there. And when did you realize that there is something wrong with this uh, attraction? You know, it's funny. I didn't realize there was something wrong until fifth grade. So like two years later, I figured out it was wrong because of course I had some idea probably that this wasn't normal. But I had a lot of male friends. I was very popular from like third grade until fifth grade. And then it dropped off really quickly because I realized it was wrong. But from third grade to fifth grade, I had tons of friends. I was always very flirtatious with all of my male friends. They liked it. They were flirtatious back. It was very just like sweet, you know? Yeah. Like I, I felt like I had like 15 different boyfriends. <laughs> it was like my best period. Uh, <laughs> at the age of like eight, nine yeah, years yeah, like old. 11, yeah, yeah. I, I had the, the best yeah. group of boyfriends ever. <laughs> Um, I was like polyamorous without knowing it. <laughs> Are you still polyamorous, by the way? No. no? I'm mean, probably in spirit. I don't know. Oh, I, see. I don't know, actually. I mean, probably. Probably as you get older, you have to be. <laughs> It's like going to be boring not to. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, I just, I was like, I, I just felt this like universal love. Nothing felt complex. It just felt like, okay, this is how my life is. And I think I could have gone on that way. If someone hadn't said it was weird, I mean, my friend Nathan, who was head of the basketball team, really cute, he was just like, this is weird, the way we're acting. He just started telling me that when I would stay over, you know, we like kissed one time just to see what it's like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then he was like, oh, we shouldn't do that. And I'm like, why not? It was great. 
And that like he he started to sort of let me know that it wasn't normal. And then from there, but it never erupted into me being treated terribly. It was just like I could feel the difference and I could feel that I was a weirdo, you know, and I sort of leaned into it. Like as at a young age, I, I was like, well, okay, if everyone thinks I'm weird, then I'll just be weird. And so it was like I just started reading a lot by myself and sort of becoming more interested in studying and and like when people would say things like they would make fun of me or I felt like they were gonna make fun of me, I would just be like, yeah, I'm I'm fat. Like because I was he I was heavier at the time. Yes. Like yeah, I'm fat. Do you want to see? And I would just like show like my fat rolls and be like. <laughs> Do you like that? So I was only bullied outright in like shop class. So we had like a <laughs> class devoted to like learning how to like use tools and work in a shop and like, you know, work on cars and stuff. Yes. And I was actually pretty good at it. I was very good at like welding and doing things like that. And, and But the guys there could tell that I was different. Like they could just, I don't know, they Feel could it. smell it yeah, in the air. Like animals. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, of course, they could just tell, you know. Um, and I think as I was getting older, like some of my desires for men were more obvious to see. You know, like I would try to hide it. We all think we're very coy and no one can see our glances <laughs> when we're younger. <laughs> like when you're like watching, you know, the other kid in the seat ahead of you and just sort of staring at his back or like if he's standing up and you see his jeans scrunched a certain way and you're like, okay, I'm going to watch. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I think they could tell. They can tell yeah. that you're thinking that way. And, and so... Um, that was the moment when you learned how to hide it. Yeah, I learned. I think I was pretty good at it, but everyone always thinks they're good at hiding who they are. The shop class was the only place where I feel like they could detect it. And it began to seem so scary that they might detect it and then tell everyone else that that's whenever I got my first girlfriend. I can remember the, <laughs> the, the worst uh, time, uh, place in my school was the locker room. Oh, yeah, it is the worst. They all are yeah. changing, and you are supposed to yeah. watch either them or just <laughs> yes. your yeah, and size on the floor. And, then and like, there's like a natural ball. way, right? Like there's, a, there's supposed to be a natural way that you're supposed to act in, an, in a locker room, right? Uh -huh. But like there's no way that you, as a new teenage gay man are supposed are gonna act like there's no right way to act you're just Absolutely. like you're either too cold or you're like acting weirdly you know it's 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 a mess <laughs> yeah. how did you come to the conversational therapy well it's kind of a long story but I'll try to make it shorter When my dad became a preacher when I was 16, like I said, I had a girlfriend. I made that work for a little while. We, I loved Chloe. Um, she was a very wonderful person to be around. She kept me safe in the halls. You know, it was like the weirdness that was starting to be detected at that high school went away. Because it was like, oh, you know, she's, she's a beautiful young girl. Like, she was very cute. So I got, not only did I have a girlfriend, but I had a very beautiful girlfriend. And so it was like, okay, well, it's all fine now. Yeah, um, yeah no questions asked. But of course, Chloe and I, like, we knew something was up because I didn't even find it comfortable to kiss her, especially not make out with her. And then, you know, it, it was just really awkward. Her brother, he is now openly gay, and he was closeted at the time. He was younger. He was like, I don't know, five or six years younger than me. And he was caught one night with someone else, with another boy. And my dad, as a new preacher, was asked to go speak to her brother and this boy who had been caught, not knowing that I was gay, right? right? I'm sitting there on the sofa with my mom. Chloe calls me and is like, I don't know what's going on. Your dad has come over to my house. I think my brother is gay. I don't know what to do. And I'm like, it's okay, Chloe, it'll be fine thinking I'm a total hypocrite because I'm closeted and I'm here like letting my dad go perform basically conversion therapy yes. upon my girlfriend's brother. That's awkward. <laughs> yeah. Right? And, uh, and so my dad does this and I'm waiting with mom and she's like, 
what's wrong? Like, I know this is stressful, but it feels like you're more stressed out than you should be. And I was like, it's fine, mom, nothing. Like, I don't know, it's just weird. It's a weird moment. And right after my dad came back, he said like, well, I don't think that the boys will be doing this anymore. I don't know what he said to them, probably gave them Bible verses, told them, you know, never do it again. But um, <laughs> didn't work, he's very gay <laughs> now. Uh, living in like San Francisco. Oh, um, cool. But you know, I, I remember thinking to myself when my dad came back, it was like two in the morning and he stayed over there for a long time talking to them. I remember thinking, I can't be out as a gay man, but I also can't be this much of a hypocrite. I can't be like a total fake person. Because I just, I can't be, it's, it's hard for me to lie now. I broke up with Chloe like a couple of weeks after that. And I said, she asked me like, what's wrong? What did I do wrong? And, you know, and I'm like, nothing. I just don't feel anything anymore. Never explained why. I just broke it off. Her family couldn't understand. My family couldn't understand. It was a mystery. If you want the whole story, it's depressing. But, you know, I had a roommate at the time um, who... I had known earlier in high school. He was like a casual acquaintance. And we thought, good idea, room together. He knew a lot about me. At one point I told him what my struggles were, you know. But I, I coded it in a kind of like, maybe with enough prayer, I won't be. Maybe maybe this isn't a, this is a temporary situation, right? So I tell him this. And late one night, um, I don't know what caused him to do this. I don't know what brought it on. No one ever knows these things, but he snuck into my bunk bed while I was asleep and raped me. Um, I like thought that I could resist it. I thought that there was a way that I could, because there was no sexual desire there. It was like whatever sexual yeah. desire there might have been for him was completely eradicated in that moment. You know, I just, I was like, I do not want this. No, this is not something I want. Right. But um, I remember thinking at some point, like, this is, this is what I deserve, right? This is what Shit. I. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you told me to tell you the whole story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I remember thinking all the things I had ingested in my childhood, which is like, gay sex is rape, was proven true in that moment. For me it was like oh so the thing that i wanted the thing i fantasized about it's this it's terrifying it's not what i want you know, exactly the same thing happened to me really like at, when i was 15 years old when some uh, random guy in the bus started to approach me and then we took out of the bus like uh somewhere to neglect places when he was trying to give me a blowjob and then to rape me and i was like Okay, this is exactly what I was uh, dreaming about all my life. So now choke it. Yeah, it was. It has nothing to do with sexual desire. No, it doesn't. Because you're fucking raped. Almost. I know, and that's the thing is, queer people are often more vulnerable mm -hmm. in this way. And exactly the same, like, oh yeah, I deserve it because yeah. I wanted it. And exactly. Because I allowed allowed him to take me from that bus and bring me yeah. to this place and. So that's what I just did myself. Yeah, and mm -hmm. then you, you have two messages. One is that you deserved this kind of punishment. And the other one that is, if I'm going to continue being myself, I guess I have to just live with this. Like, this is what I deserve to be treated like, right? Yeah. And yeah, I think the, the problem is that we're told this from a very young age, if you grow up in, in a society that is homophobic, right? Like. Gay sex is not real love. It's not, it can't contain love. It's just sex or at worst rape, right? Mm -hmm. So when this happens, I don't say a word. I'm like, I'm like, okay, well, I don't want anyone to know what just happened. I, I didn't ask for it. I don't think I asked for it, but maybe I did and I don't know, you know? Mm -hmm. But I did end up telling, so right after this happened, this is the worst, it's like the craziest set of circumstances, the worst possible first sexual experience you could have. Mm -hmm. So he rapes me, then he like apologizes and is crying and he says, I did this to a 14 year old boy. 
and like recently in his youth group in church. And I was like, you did what? And he was like, I raped him. He would said the word. And I was like, because I wasn't even thinking it was rape. You know, I was like, I don't know what just happened, but I'm not going to use the R word, you know. So he's like serial. He's a rapist. serial rapist. And I don't, I guess he just rapes everyone that might be gay or I don't know what, or like that he thinks has a secret. Because probably, I don't know this, but I'm sure that the boy probably said something. And then he's like, okay, I'm going to use this. Because right after he told me this, um, I mean, I was just like in shock. And that's what, I think I'm kind of lucky. I mean, it sounds really weird to say that. But I think I'm lucky that he told me that right after he raped me. Because I thought, that's totally wrong. Like, yeah. raping a 14-year-old boy is 100% wrong. So maybe what he did to me was 100% wrong. And I just, I remember thinking, like, I'm never going to tell what he did to me, but I'm going to tell what he did to that boy because I don't want him around children. So I went to the pastor. Um, it, was, it was a religious school, yes. um, college. I went to the pastor, and I said, I told her the story about the 14-year-old boy, and she encouraged me to keep quiet. Yeah, she said that it was hearsay, that there was no way I could prove it, and that people said crazy things. I ended up telling one other person, Charles and Domi well, Charles and his sister Dominique, who are also in the book but not in the film, mm -hmm. and um, they told their mom, and their mom called him, and she was like, "You're a disgusting human being. You deserve to be put behind bars." And his retaliation for that was to call my mother, who he knew, and to tell her that I was gay. The only real story that they knew of someone who had been gay was like Matthew Shepard, who was murdered. Yes. He was like strung up like Christ outside of, uh, where was it? it, was in Wyoming, I think, and like left to because die. Because of his gayness. Yeah, because he was gay. I was placed in a group full of people dealing with not only sexuality, they were dealing with things like bestiality, they were mm -hmm. dealing with things like pedophilia, they were dealing with marriage issues, uh, How come pedophilia? It's like a criminal offense. Yeah, you here's the thing. You should go to the court and the jail, yeah. not to the... These are pedophilic thoughts ah. rather than actions. But here's the thing. It all operated under the assumption that every one of these things was the same thing. They were all addicted to some kind of aberrant sexuality, something wrong or abnormal, right? Another thing that I often have audiences react to is when I say that, they're like, oh, I can't believe that, you know? And then I say, do you happen to have an uncle, perhaps, or someone in your family, like a great-grandfather, who has said to you, um, well, if we have gay marriage, what are we going to have, people having sex with animals? And then they go, yeah, and I'm like, well... That's that idea is the same idea that was present in conversion therapy. And this it's very popular idea yes. in back in Russia actually. The pedophilia. What's next? Like let's yeah. rape children or well, animals. The pedophilia idea is huge in Russia. I know. And in Ukraine, it was like this idea that you can't let your children around queer people because they will molest them or or turn them somehow yeah, turn yeah. them convert gay. them to gay people. <laughs> yeah. If only it were that easy. We'd just convert the whole world. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but <Can> we? <laughs> yeah. If we could, uh, I would be tempted. Attire. Women's skirts must extend below the knee and bras are to be worn at all times. Confidentiality. All matters discussed in therapy are to remain private. Restrooms. Members must be supervised by staff during restroom visits. All reading material and films and television are off limits while inside the program. The method, actually, of mm. uh, um, treatment of... I, th I like to call it the kitchen sink method. Just throw everything into the kitchen sink and hope something works, you know? Uh -huh. They used uh, outdated psychoanalysis. They used uh -huh. Freudian theory. Old models of family life, like probably from the 1960s. Right, that a gay man was an invert, which, you know, or a pervert, someone who was experiencing the opposite of what he should experience. So 
Um, it was it was the same idea that um, popularized American hospitals at the time in the 1960s and 70s when people were trying to treat gay people with lobotomies. They weren't doing lobotomies there, but it was the same idea, right? Like erase it, cut it out, get it get it out of yourself. How exactly you can erase it? So you do a kind of brainwashing. Uh -huh. I mean, the brainwashing is brainwashing is incredibly simple to pull off. By the yes. way, I've learned. So if I just repeat to you for like two hours, if you're just trapped here, and I repeat to you the fact that this room is pink, you will like start to kind of see it as pink. Okay, fuck it, it's pink. Yeah, it's already exactly. pink. Yeah, and and you will actually start to kind of see pinkish tones. Like you'll you'll allow your brain to do it. And so ah. there's a lot of repetition. There was something that the the head of Love and Action, where I went, he was quoted in an interview where he said, if God tells me that the color of the wall is blue and I see yellow, then I have to believe that the wall is blue because God told me so. And you started believing it. And you just see the wall is blue. So this is something you personally experienced. Yeah. You started to see the wall blue. Well, yeah, because I came in rather skeptical because it was silly. It was like, what am I, I'm going to like blame it on my parents. Am I going to sit here and do like a craft lesson? Because a lot of it was like we had to make masks that showed what we showed the outside world and what we felt ourselves to be on the inside, which is really cheesy, right? And then like we had to do these things like uh, these lie, lie chair exercises where we had to sit across from an empty chair. Yeah. And we had to imagine that our fathers were sitting. If we were a man, a gay man, Obviously, you hate your father. That's like mm -hmm. it's a stereotype that you're they have. Is, there you go. Um, I'm yeah, it's a cliche. I'm not gonna pretend I hate my father. I don't hate my father. Jared, you do. You don't know me. Which I didn't personally. I don't no, know. I don't hate my father either. I've never hated my father. I've been mad at him, like every person that I've ever From known. Time to time. Yeah. yeah, and so they ran off of these stereotypes. They made you act them out until you began to believe them. There's a way in which you can use those Bible verses as a weapon. And there's a way in which, even if you disagree with me, even if you think that gay people are going to hell, like there's a way that you can not use that as a weapon, right? You can actually just see me as a human being sitting across from you and have compassion for me, which is what Jesus would do, right? When Jesus had compassion for like a whore at the well a woman who had like five different men and he's still like, you're great, give me water. You know, like he was not a person who sat there and judged people for their labels. He didn't care about them. I think that like there's a way of reading the Bible in which you can be really mean to people who are different from you. And there's a way where you can look at what Jesus did and you can say, I'm going to sit with everyone and I'm going to talk with them because that's a decent thing to do as a human being. What were the real outcomes of this so-called therapy? Because uh, in the film, it's depicted as there was even suicide. Yeah, so there are a lot of suicides that came about from conversion therapy. In, there. in what time period? I'm not sure. It's like, I have a list of names that we used whenever we spoke with the former director. He could probably tell you more. But it's it's a, you know, I would say... Some of these people are dealing with the things that they received at Love in Action for years before they kill themselves. And sometimes it gets better, and then they relapse. This kind of thinking, the brainwashing that was in our heads, it doesn't leave you. You know, I'm still working through it. Like, I'm a healthy person, I think, generally, but I still struggle with shame. And it's wow. because of what they put in my head. I think that you can't get rid of some of that stuff, you know? It's... I speak with people on a daily basis who are texting me, former conversion therapy victims, who say to me, like, I, I started listening to the tapes again of a conversion therapist that I had, and Before. I started, because they, they, they want that assurance of a world that makes sense to them. The world that they're in now doesn't make sense to them because they were brainwashed. You know, when you come out of brainwashing, there are steps that have to happen and people don't get those steps because they never saw it as brainwashing so like some of those people were in it for two or three years you know 
longer. They spend inside of those centers. Yeah, sometimes five years, sometimes ten years. People have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to cure themselves over the years. They've they've gone into like hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt. They've ruined their lives. They've ruined every relationship. They've cut themselves off from their parents because that's what they're told they're supposed to do. It's a total cult. And so when you get out of a cult, if you don't have something there as a support system, right, then you're going to falter and you're going to want to go back to that simpler time that even if it was terrible for you, the world made sense. That's what Love in Action gave us. It gave us a set of instructions. It gave us a set of rules that we could follow and we could no longer be quite as hated as we were before. Our families might love us one day. We might love ourselves one day. It, it gave us a set of rules to do that. Such a manipulation. It and, is. Uh, now, at this point, <laughs> uh, love and action still exists. No, luckily. So that one's gone. There have many, been many that popped up <sighs> in its wake. You spent like only two weeks, But and that was, that was like 17 years ago. The movie kind of makes it easier because, like, four years later, I'm in New York. That didn't happen, right? Four years later, I came back from, you know, I was going to Ukraine and going back in the closet and all this stuff. So. There was, there was a lot more of a journey there. And I've only just now kind of um, gotten to the place where I feel a kind of peace. You can imagine like writing this book was incredibly hard. I, I didn't want to write it. I felt an obligation to write it. I also didn't want to throw my parents under a bus. I wanted them to have dignity. I wanted everyone to have dignity in the story. But when it became a film, when it became publicly talked about, I thought, when I wrote that book and I finished it, I thought, I did it. I'm over. I'm over it all. It's fine. You know, at the end of my memoir, at the end of the film, I'm like myself, right? Um, well, right after that, about three years after finishing college, I went to Ukraine and Um, came back to the closet. Yeah, I had to go back in the closet. Why? Well, Peace Corps told me I probably should. Uh -huh. So I was in the Peace Corps. It was, you know, they, they have regulations and, and sort of ways of doing things that are smarter. They said, you know, we can give you a post that is more open. Like we could give you something close to Kiev. We can give you something close to, you know, Lviv that's a little bit... Bigger, Wait, yeah, easier to be open. But I wanted to have a real experience, and so I don't know real why. Real hardcore experience. I don't know why. It's like youth, you know, you're like, I'm going to go to the other side of the world and figure things out and do In all this stuff. In the middle of nowhere. I mean, I'm really happy that I did it. I went to a small village of 2,000 people, and I taught school there, and I lived basically in everyone's lives you know that yeah. like everyone was a part of my life my neighbors i knew them all like here i don't even know my neighbors right right but in that village i knew them really well yeah because it's only 2000 it was people. wonderful one woman gave me chicken i mean eggs from her chicken mm -hmm. i like got milk from a cow that i saw you know <laughs> that i knew every day <laughs> um like it was great it sounds yeah. like a cliche but it was wonderful and how much time did you spend there three years And you didn't have, like, boyfriend or sex or anything for three years. I didn't say I didn't have sex, <laughs> but I didn't have a boyfriend. <laughs> I didn't have very much sex, let me say that. Not of much course. at all. Because I was terrified also. It was like, you know, that sort of internalized homophobia that I'd felt growing up came back to me in that village because people... The thing is, you know, in Ukraine at least, people said that gay people didn't exist. But... They talked about gay people all the time. You know, like it was like there was a, there would often, because the news cycles would often talk about gay stuff in the U.S. and they would see it sometimes on their own news cycles, people would talk about it. It's not to say that everyone reacted the exact same way, but a lot of people were very negative toward it, and so I just didn't ever say anything. First of all, I learned to love people in spite of the fact that I thought that they might not like me for who I was. Yes. I just decided that I was going to love them anyway no matter what, because I did, I couldn't hide it. You know, I, I fell in love with, with the country and, and I was young and impressionable and it, I loved it.
But when I did start to tell people individually, I, I told the director of my school, who was a really strong woman, she was great. And then when I told my host family, I was like in stages I would tell people. Yeah. They were actually so much better. They didn't want to offend me because they knew me. They knew who I was. They had loved me for like three years. And this information was not going to change the fact that they loved me. So it didn't change anything. No. Only for better. I know. I mean, it was awkward. What's the point that you should yeah, do it like from I the know. very beginning? Well, because I, I honestly still think that if I had if I'd gone to that village and just been like, I'm gay. Yeah. I don't too many prejudices. I think it might have been bad. I don't maybe I'm not giving them enough credit, but I think that my method of making them love me and me being a good teacher to all of their students, you know, someone who's obviously not a pedophile, yeah. obviously not like whatever name that they've heard gay people are, but I've like helped them for this number of years. I've learned their language. I've taken the effort to learn their culture and not speak stupidly about Ukraine or anything like that. Like that trust could not be broken once it was there. I think that's one of the biggest things and, and one of the things about your your project that you're doing that's important, which is that sometimes people can't see the humanity in us past the labels, right? Yes. Like they hear they hear rumors, they hear a certain thing. I felt the same way when I was a young closeted gay man, when I saw openly gay men on TV or in the street with feather boas half naked, I was terrified of that. Of course. I was like, I wanted that, but I was terrified of it. And part of it was that I didn't want to only be that person, right? But the thing that you don't know when you see those images, when those are the only images of queer people that you see, is that you don't understand that they're like drinking coffee at 8 a.m., not with a feather boa on, not with a jock strap on. They're just sitting there. Well, maybe they are. Maybe they are, and that'd be great. But like most people are just like in their PJs, drinking their coffee and living their lives like the rest of us. And and then they go out and celebrate. But like, and, and I would dare anyone, any straight person, you know, if we looked at their whole life and saw what they did all day, we would mostly be bored. But every now and then we could take one picture of them that looked really incriminating and really strange. And we could blow that up and say, look at all straight people being crazy. Right? I mean, that's, that's the thing. How much time did it get them, your parents, to completely accept uh, your mm. uh, queerness? Well, it's not done yet. <laughs> my dad, my dad is still kind of a work in progress. Um, so he's still a preacher right. in a small town. He has about 150 people that are in his congregation. He doesn't preach out against me. He doesn't talk about homosexuality at all. But he's certainly not like marching in any pride parades. <laughs> so we've had arguments, you know, we continue to have arguments in the past. But like I said, I've never stopped loving him for better or worse. And I think that, uh, well, like recently, you know, I'm married now. We got into an argument about that because I said, well, what if he sat at the table here? Like, what are you going to do? And he said that he would have to leave the house, that he couldn't sit and condone that behavior. So your husband does not accept your dad? No, no, no. My dad will not accept my husband. And luckily, my husband will not accept my dad either. Because he was like, well, if he doesn't want me to sit at the table, then I'm, I don't want to sit at the table with him either. Oh, okay. um, But, you know, we got into an argument because, and I said something that I think was maybe shocking to him in a good way. My dad's one of those old school Southerners that like, he can appreciate it when you're kind of an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you're strong and like, yeah. and so I said to him like, listen, I'm the one that has made our family's name something that people will remember. And I will be because I'm gonna write a bunch of books and they're all gonna be good. <laughs> I'm an egotist whenever I have to be. I mean, you have to believe in your own work, right? Yes, absolutely. And I was like, I'm, if anyone's going to make a name here, it's me. Our name is synonymous with me. So, like, what do you want? Do you want to be part of that? Or do you want to be erased from the story? Would you like me to erase you like you tried to erase me? 
And I said, listen, my husband on any family tree that is drawn up from this point on, anyone that we will see you know, on the internet, anywhere, he is right next to my name. He's in the family tree just as much as your name is on the family tree. That is an undeniable fact. And you can't change facts. Like, he's part of the family. So if you would like to leave the family, here is the door. <laughs> and what did he respond? He cried. And I, you know, there was a time when I would have wanted those tears, but it was too late. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, well, I was crying for like 15 years for you, so it's your turn, you know. And I believe that sometimes when you love someone, you have to be tough like that. You know, he was certainly tough on me. And there's a crisis within the church. There's a huge crisis which has exploded because of LGBTQ issues, right? It didn't have to be LGBTQ issues. It could have been race. It did yes. kind of it did kind of explode in the U.S. during the 60s and 70s because there were a lot of white Christians who were saying like we will not allow black people into our church. That caused one of the crises. Now the new crisis, we've like sort of pretended to get over race, and now the big crisis is like you've got queer people in your church. What are you going to do? You can't erase them. They're there. In fact, they're probably there more than any other place. I've, there used to be a joke like, if you want to date, go to church. Um, you're not going to erase those people. They're there. So what are you going to do now? I get it. Admitting that you're wrong about something or admitting that there might be something more complex to the story is very hard. I always talk with my father's belief. I tried to, it made him really angry when I explained it this way. But I said, you know, like, you know that game Jenga? Mm -hmm. The like tower, it's like oh yeah, of course. You like you put one block yeah, yeah, on top sure. of the other, and you yeah, try to tower. make sure it doesn't fall over, mm -hmm. right? So I always say at the bottom, those are the hardest blocks, right? Because if you move some of those, the whole thing falls down immediately. So you kind of start in the middle, and you like feel around for the easier ones. Well, the easier ones in religion are like women don't wear veils anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Women are allowed to speak. Those are the easier ones, right? And they're like we've decided that we're not going to believe that certain crazy things that we believed are true anymore, right? The harder ones, the ones at the basis of all of it, is marriage, which the church as an institution created, right? So like you start playing with marriage, you start playing with the idea of who should be with whom, and the whole thing can topple. So, But it didn't. You it, just have same-sex marriage yeah. and... Guess what? The it, church is still yeah, there. It doesn't topple, but they believe it will topple. Mm -hmm. So they think, they think that it's that game, right? That like, if they move these pieces, it's going to fall over. But the truth is, if your faith, if your God is so weak that he will topple over at like a gay man in a feather boa, <laughs> then you should probably rethink your faith. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's not gonna topple, right? Like, it's fine. <laughs>
I think we try as writers to write something different. You know, we're always like, I'm going to do something totally different. I'm going to set it in the 18th century, and it has nothing to do with my life. <laughs> and then by the end of the draft, you're like, oh, I wrote the same book. You know? <laughs> I'm always writing the same book. Tell Just me about your in. life now. <laughs> uh, you have your uh, husband. For how many years you were together? Three and a half. Yeah. We had a quick marriage. I knew. <laughs> oh, oh. I just like a quick marriage, a quick one. A yeah. Oh, well, I mean, I just I knew. I was no, like three and a half. It's like long time. Yeah, but we we knew each other people. like for like a year, and then ah, we got married. I see. Yeah, I just fell in love. <laughs> What does he do for a living? So he's a software engineer, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. who reads a lot. Most of those books in there are his. Oh, I thought it's yours. No, he reads way more than I do. I hit the jackpot, like a software engineer who also reads yeah, tons yeah, of literature. Yeah, yeah, that's rare. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Congrats. We were, yeah, so. uh, any plans on children? Not yet. I, I think like I really want to be ready if that time comes, and I don't think I'm ready. I've met plenty of people with children, and I've seen the transformation. And like, yeah, I you don't like that transformation. Well, I'm the type of person that becomes obsessed really easily. Like. I told you I just I married my husband within a year of meeting him. I was like, okay, there, uh, life settled. So and like my novel, I write three hours every day without stopping. Like just every day, I'm a creature of habit. So if I put a child into that equation, I will do everything in my entire life to make that child happy. Like I know myself, I will be like obsessed. It's not good for the child. It's not good for me. <laughs> like I need to be in a different place before I become that. I see that person because I see my older child like once in a month because living he lives in the how old another, is he? He's eight and a half years old. Oh my god! And yeah, I have to go back and forth to another country to visit him. That's so tough. It's just once a month for yeah. a weekend, and my younger son, who is just a year and a half old, wow, I can see him like a couple or three times a week. Wow, but it doesn't change my routine oh, and all my life dramatically. Well, you're giving me a new understanding of what I can yeah, do. Yeah, you can just have a baby with the lesbian couple. I need lesbians. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what I we need. all need lesbians. Well, we need more lesbians in our lives. <laughs> That's always true. No, it's really true because, yeah. like, I, I mean, I get along with lesbians better most of the time than gay men because I think I'm more of a lesbian. I'm like a creature of habit. I like to go hiking. Not that all lesbians like to go hiking, but I know, love going hiking. I just came back from Chile. Yeah, hiking, playing those Yeah, I'm gonna be canceled for saying this about lesbians, probably, because like I. I not the stereotypes, but like I just tend to like women more. It's like it's just just where my heart goes, because I, I feel like I understand them more. Um, but yeah, we need more lesbians, generally, to make the world better. <laughs>